The cipher manuscripts are a collection of 56 folios containing the structural outline of a series of magical initiation rituals. The cipher manuscripts are the original source upon which the rituals and the knowledge lectures of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn were based. William Wynne Westcott, a London deputy coroner, member of the SRIA, and one of the founders of the Golden Dawn, claimed to have received the manuscripts through Reverend A.F.A. Woodford, who was a colleague of noted Masonic scholar Kenneth Mackenzie. The papers were to have been secured by Westcott after Mackenzie's death in 1886. Among the belongings of Mackenzie's mentor, the late Frederick Hockley. By September 1887, they were decoded by Westcott. The folios are drawn in black ink on cotton paper, watermarked 1809. The text is plain English, written from right to left in a substitution cryptogram known as the Trithemius cipher, attributed to Johann Trithemius, a medieval German abbot. Numerals are substituted by Hebrew letters, Aleph equals one, Beth equals two, etc. The manuscripts also contained an address of an aged adept named Fräulein Anna Springle in Germany, to whom Westcott wrote, inquiring about the contents of the papers. Miss Springle responded, and after accepting the requests of Westcott and his partner and fellow Mason Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, whom had helped translate the text, issued them a charter to operate a lodge of the order in England. Using the cipher manuscripts, Mackenzie allegedly founded the Society of Eight as the first phase of what was to later become the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Thus, Mackenzie's group was Temple Number One, and Frederick Hockley, who was alleged to be a member of the Society of Eight, founded Temple Number Two. When Isis Urania was founded, it was numbered as number three. There are letters by Mackenzie that indicate the Society of Eight existed, but nothing that describes what they actually taught or practiced. The ciphers contain the outlines of a series of graded rituals and the syllabus for a course of instruction in Kopala and Hermetic magic, including astrology, tarot, geomancy, and alchemy. The occult materials in the manuscripts are a compendium of the classical magical theory and symbolism known in the Western world up until the middle of the 19th century, combined to create an encompassing model of the Western mystery tradition and arranged into a syllabus of a graded course of instruction in magical symbolism. Hermeticism, alchemy, Kabbalah, astrology, and Tarot were certainly not unknown to 19th century scholars of the magical arts. The cipher is a compendium of previously known magical traditions. Much of the hierarchical structure for the Golden Dawn came from the Societius Rosicruciana in Anglia, which was itself derived from the Order of the Golden and Rosy Cross. The Societus Rosicruciana in Anglia, Rosicrucian Society of England, is a Masonic, esoteric, Christian order formed by Robert Wentworth Little and Kenneth Mackenzie in 1865. The Order of the Golden and Rosy Cross Orden des Gold und Rosenkranz, 
also the Fraternity of the Golden and Rosy Cross, was a German Rosicrucian organization founded in the 1750s by a Freemason and alchemist, Hermann Fichtuld. The discussions between Rus and Kellner did not lead to any positive results at the time. Because Rus was very busy with the revival of the Order of Illuminati, along with his associate Leopold Engel, 1858-1931, of Dresden, Kellner did not approve of the revived Illuminati Order, nor of Engel. According to Rus, upon his final separation with Engel in June 1902, Kellner contacted him and the two agreed to proceed with the establishment of Ordo Templi Orientis by seeking authorizations to work the various rites of high-grade masonry. Roos and Kellner together prepared a brief manifesto for their order in 1903, which was published the next year in the Oriflamme. Kellner died on June 7, 1905, Carl Kellner and Patial Beverly Randolph were members. In Theodore Roos' 1917 OTO Constitution, it states in Article 1, Section 1, Under the style and title, Ancient Order of Oriental Templars, an organization formerly known as the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, has been reorganized and reconstituted. This reconstituted association is an international organization and is hereinafter referred to as the OTO. The Order's teachings drew heavily from the magico-sexual theories of Patial Beverly Randolph. Prior to the rise of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1888, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor was the only order that taught practical occultism in the Western mystery tradition. Among its members were a number of occultists, spiritualists, and theosophists. Initial relations between the order and the Theosophical Society were cordial, with most members of the order also prominent members of the TS. Later, there was a falling out, as the order was opposed to the Eastern-based teachings of the later Blavatsky. Davidson considered that Blavatsky had fallen under the influence of, quote, a greatly inferior order belonging to the Buddhist cult, end quote. Conversely, the conviction in 1886 of the secretary of the order Thomas Henry Burgoyne, for fraud, was claimed by the Theosophists to show the immorality of the order. The early history of OTO is difficult to trace reliably. It originated in Germany or Austria between 1895 and 1906. Its apparent founder was Karl Kellner, a wealthy Austrian industrialist, in 1895, although nothing verifiable is known of the order until 1904. Theodore Roos, 1855 to 1923, collaborated with Kellner in creating OTO and succeeded him as head of OTO after Kellner's death. Under Roos, charters were given to occult brotherhoods in France, Denmark, Switzerland, the USA, and Austria. There were nine degrees, of which the first six were Masonic. In 1902, Roos, along with Franz Hartmann and Henry Klein, purchased the right to perform the rites of Memphis and Mizraim of Freemasonry, the authority of which was confirmed 
in 1904 and again in 1905. Although these rights are considered to be irregular, they, along with the Swedenborg right, form the core of the newly established order. From as early as 1738, one can find traces of the right of Memphis and Mizraim, filled with alchemical, occult, and Egyptian references with a structure of 90 degrees. Joseph Balsamo, called Cogliostro, a key character of his time, gave the right the impulse necessary for its development. Very close to the Grand Master of the Order of the Knights of Malta, Manuel Pinto de Fonseca, Cogliostro founded the right of High Egyptian Masonry in 1784. Between 1767 and 1775, he received the Arcana Arcanorum, which are three very high hermetic degrees, from Sir Knight Luigi de Aquino, the brother of the National Grand Master of Neapolitan Masonry. In 1788, he introduced them into the right of Mizraim and gave a patent to this right. It developed quickly in Milan, Genoa, and Naples. In 1803, it was introduced by Joseph, Michel, and Mar Bedaride. During this period of time, the right recruited not only aristocrats, but Bonapartists and Republicans, and sometimes even revolutionary Carbonari. It was forbidden in 1817, following the incident of the four sergeants of La Rochelle and the uneasiness caused by the Carbonari. Lodges became meeting places for the opponents to the regime, which led to the decline of the right, and around 1890, the last masons of the right regrouped in the only remaining lodge, Arc and Chiel. The four sergeants of La Rochelle, Boris, Goubain, Pomier, and Raoul, were guillotined in Paris in 1822. Their great courage initiated a liberal campaign and they became legendary. They became particularly popular figures amongst the Carbonari in Italy. The flag used by the four sergeants was once owned by Prince Jerome Bonaparte. It is a French tricolor bearing the slogans Constitution and Napoleon II on one side, and Honor and Fatherland on the other. The flag was used by the Carbonari Ventis between 1821 and 1822. It was seen during the plot of the 29th Line Regiment in Belfort, then in Paris, and finally in La Rochelle where it was preserved. It passed through the hands of the Lieutenant Colonel Caron, then to Major du Bourgeois, then to Marquis d'Andon, who finally offered it to Prince Napoleon in 1888. The Swedenborg Rite or right of Swedenborg, was a fraternal order modeled on Freemasonry and based upon the teachings of Emanuel Swedenborg. It comprised six degrees, apprentice, fellow craft, master neophyte, illuminated theosophite, blue brother, and red brother. It was created in Avignon in 1773 by the Marquis de Thorn. It was initially a political organization whose aims were to bring Freemasonry into disrepute, although the political ideology was eventually discarded from the right. This version of the Swedenborg right died out within a decade of its founding. Starting in the 1870s, the right was resurrected as a hermetic organization. This version faded out sometime around 1908. 
The rite is now extinct, but influenced the development of other groups, such as Ordo Templi Orientis. A passage from The Secret Inner Order Rituals of the OTO. 1. Take a suitable woman willing to aid thee in this work. Explain to her fully the precautions to be taken and the manner of life necessary. Let her horoscope be, if possible, suited to the nature of the homunculus proposed as to have an incarnate spirit of benevolence. Let Jupiter be rising in Pisces with good aspects of soul, Venus and Luna, and with no notable contrary dispositions, or so far as may be possible. 2. Take now a man suitable, if convenient, thyself, or some other brother initiate of the Gnosis, and so far as may be, let his horoscope also harmonize with the nature of the work. 3. Let the man and woman copulate continuously, but especially at times astrologically favorable to thy working, and that in a ceremonial manner in a prepared temple, whose particular arrangement and decoration is also suitable to thy work, and let them will ardently and constantly the success of thy work, denying all other desires. Thus proceed until impregnation results. In the work Moonchild, numerous acquaintances of the author, Aleister Crowley, appear as thinly disguised fictional characters. Crowley portrays McGregor Mathers as the primary villain, including him as the character named SRMD, using the abbreviation of Mathers' magical name. Arthur Edward Waite appears as a villain named Arthwaite, and the unseen head of the inner circle of which SRMD was a m member, A.B., is theosophist Annie Besant. Among Crowley's friends and allies, Alan Bennett appears as Mahatera Fang, Isadora Duncan appears as Lavinia King, and Mary d'Est as Lisa Le Gerfria. Cyril Gray is Crowley himself, while Simon If is either an idealized version of an older and wiser Crowley or his friend Alan Bennett. A year or so before the beginning of World War I, a young woman named Lisa Le Gerfria is seduced by a white magician, Cyril Gray, and persuaded into helping him in a magical battle with the black magician and his black lodge. Gray is attempting to raise the level of his force by impregnating the girl with the soul of an ethereal being, the moon child. To achieve this, she will have to be kept in a secluded environment, and many preparatory magical rituals will be carried out, the black magician Douglas is bent on destroying Gray's plan. However, Gray's ultimate motives may not be what they appear. The Moonchild rituals are carried out in southern Italy, but the occult organizations are based in Paris and England. At the end of the book, the war breaks out, and the white magicians support the Allies, while the black magicians support the Central Powers. The Babylon Working was a series of magic ceremonies or rituals commenced on March 2, 1946 by Jack Parsons, essentially designed to manifest an individual incarnation of the archetypal divine feminine called Babylon, as well as to catalyze the reification of that force as it exists latently in every man and woman. During the ceremony, L. Ron Hubbard acted as a scribe, noting the results of the magical workings. When Parson declared that the first of the series of rituals was complete and successful, he almost immediately met Marjorie Cameron in his own home 
and regarded her as the creation of the ritual, considered her his scarlet woman, and soon began the next stage of the series, an attempt to conceive a child through sexual magical workings. Although no child was conceived, this did not affect the result of the ritual to that point. Parsons and Cameron soon married. The rituals performed drew largely upon the Enochian magical system devised by Dr. John Dee and Sir Edward Kelly. They also drew heavily from rituals and sex magic described by Aleister Crowley, who in turn borrowed many aspects of his Babylon from combining the Babylonian goddess Ishtar with the figure of Mystery Babylon, the great whore in the biblical book of Revelation. A brief text entitled The Book of Babylon, or Liber 49, was written by Jack Parsons as a transmission from the goddess of or force called Babylon, received by him during the Babylon working. Parsons said that Liber 49 constituted a fourth chapter of Liber al Vel Legis, the Book of the Law, the holy text of Thelema. In the Gematria of Hermetic Kabbalah, Aleister Crowley equated the number 156 with Babylon, equating the letter O with the Hebrew letter Ayin, which has the value 70. In Anakian, Babylon means wicked. Babylon means a harlot. The Vision and the Voice Liber 418 Chronicles the Mystical Journey of Aleister Crowley, 1875-1947, as he explored the Thirty Enochian Ethers, originally developed by Dr. John D. and Edward Kelly in the 16th century. These visions took place at two times, in 1900 during his stay in Mexico, and later in 1909 in Algeria in the company of poet Victor Benjamin Newberg. Of all his works, Crowley considered this book to be second in importance behind the Book of the Law, the text that established his religious and philosophical system of Thelema in 1904. The vision and the voice is the source of many of the central spiritual doctrines of Thelema, especially in the visions of Babylon and her consort Chaos, the All-Father, as well as an account of how an individual might cross the abyss, thereby assuming the title of Master of the Temple and taking a place in the city of the pyramids under the night of Pan. Crowley describes the method of this work's transmission in its introduction thus. The method of obtaining the vision and the voice was as follows. The seer had with him a great golden topaz, set in a calvary cross of six squares, made of wood and painted vermilion, which was engraved with a Greek cross of five squares charged with a rose of forty-nine petals. He held this as a rule in his hand. After choosing a spot where he was not likely to be disturbed, he would take this stone and recite the Enochian call, and after satisfying himself that the forces invoked were actually present, made the topaz play a part not unlike that of the looking-glass in the case of Alice. He would then describe what he saw and repeat what he heard, and Frater O.V., the scribe, would write down his words and incidentally observe any phenomena that, which struck him as peculiar. By drafting these thirty Enochian airs, Crowley brought the total number of Enochian evocations up from D's sum of eighteen plus one the last being for the thirty heirs all-inclusive, to the new aeon sum of forty-nine, a fact which would not have gone unnoticed by Crowley, 
who further writes in the introduction about how Dee and Kelly had procured their original Enochian system. Dee would have one or more of these tables, as a rule, 49 by 49, some full, others lettered only on alternate squares, before him on a writing table. Kelly would sit at what they called the holy table and gaze into a showstone in which he would see an angel who would point with a wand to letters on one of these charts in succession. Kelly would report, for example, he points to column 6, rank 31, and so on, apparently not mentioning the letter which D found and wrote down from the table before him. When the angel had finished, the message was rewritten backwards. It should also be noted by the student of Enochian magic that, although translated by Crowley, between 1901 when he began work on the Goetic Lesser Key of Solomon, and 1916 when it was published, the eleven conjurations therein, including two curses, given in the Enochian language developed by D. and Kelly in the 1500s, are not originally Enochian in their content. These appear to be translations of portions of the Goetia itself into Enochian, however should be considered no more authentically Enochian than the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey, which also uses an Enochian evocation, however substitutes the name Satan for the names of the spirits to be invoked. If Crowley's Enochian language translations of segments from Goetia were included in the corpus of authentically Enochian evocations, defined as being given in the Enochian language of D. N. Kelly, then the total sum of all these would be around 60 different calls. <laughs>